welcome everybody here tonight to the Northeast Region Caucus, uh, Sports Person Caucus. Um, I want to thank uh, the Shields for giving us the opportunity to hold it here. Good sense of location, easy access for a lot of people. So I uh, appreciate you, everyone showing up. Um, my name is Brian Soliday. I'm one of the two elected representatives uh, to all sportsmen across the Northeast Region. And then I have here with me Paul Navar. Paul is the other uh, elected uh, individual uh, representative. Two elected representatives for each of the four regions across the state. We serve a uh, two-year term. Um, I'm in my second two-year term, and then the end of that, uh, we're going to um, we'll talk about that. Uh, a couple things I'd like to talk about. Uh, we have uh, a raffle with some items tonight. For, and I think that show our appreciation. So um, once we start the presentation, I'll go around and hand everybody one of these tickets, and then we'll do some drawings at the end of the night. So we have. Couple books, we have some hats and beautiful things and stuff. So, um, we have some nice gifts for those of you that might be coming and uh, show up tonight. So, anything you want to say, No, but welcome everybody. Glad to see a good turnout. That's so important. I'm a face to face guy, not so much of an electronic guy that wants to sit in their home and watch what's going on. And I see a lot of uh, people of my age and older and younger that feel the same way. But uh, I'm glad you're all here, and I know there's probably at least this amount on, at home watching this. So uh, thanks everybody to get involved and get it from the horse's mouth versus a lot of rumors and flip around about a lot of issues going on in Colorado. So thank you so much. All right. Well, so with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, introduce the Northeast Region uh, Director, uh, Mark Wesley. And Mark's going to introduce the staff that he has here tonight. Thanks, all. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Mark Westa, the Northeast Region Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And it's so important for us to hear from you all and from the public as we go through all the policies regarding the game season structure. We talk a little bit about wolves. We have some special folks in the audience here that work for us that are experts in their field. And so they're here to ask questions if you need to. So I'd like to uh, introduce some of our staff. I'd like to first thank Saul and Paul for their work on the caucus. We'll start here on the table by table. We've got Ben Swivel, fisheries biologist. We've got Kyle McKee, he's a senior fisheries biologist in the Northeast region. In the back, we've got Mark Lamb, he's the area wildlife manager for the Fair Play Jefferson County area. Matt Martinez, area wildlife manager for the Denver Metro and West and South area up there and east of Denver as well. We've got Todd Kozad in the back, he's over in the Brush Fort Morgan area, area three. Jason Surface, who's area four, which is Fort Collins, Lenore County, most of Weld County. And we have Marty Stratton, who's a terrestrial biologist out in Brush in Fort Morgan area. We've got Joe Halseth over there. Uh, he's the area uh, terrestrial biologist for area two, which is the level one area. And I want to thank Shannon Chowler, Deputy Regional Manager, for helping set this thing up. So I uh, appreciate that. We've got, if I miss anybody, we've got uh, Karen Van Dusen, who's our public information officer. Northeast region and Jennifer Goldman who's outside at the table. She works at St. Rain State Park. So thanks to all the division staff folks that are here and uh, we're looking forward to a good discussion. So with that, I'll you turn know, back over to Saul. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mark. So again, we have a lot of information to impart on you tonight. Well, this is uh, caucuses are an interactive process, right? So don't shout out, raise your hand, uh, and we'll get you a question. One thing I, I, I put to my hands um, in terms of how you found out about this union. So, how many people found out about this through the e news, the CPW's e news? Okay. How many people through uh, social media like Facebook site? Okay. And those that didn't, how many from a friend? Okay. All right. So, if you get it, if you find out about it, or to your friends. That's one of the key things, right? Um, so what I wanted to do is really quick, I just got two quick slides here to talk about uh, CPW's e-news. And I use it because uh, there's a lot of different things that I want, that I want to be informed about from, from CPW. I don't want to have to go to the website and, and track all the news press releases. So I'm going to show you how really simple to go and sign up so that you get the information you're looking for delivered to your inbox, right? 
So this is the home page, you know, cpw.state.co.gov, right? And then at the lower left-hand corner, it, click here, and it says sign up for emails, CPW emails. When you click there, it takes you to a landing page, and it's pretty simple. Just enter in your info, select the item that you want to be informed about. So I like, you know, I'm interested in hunting and conservation and gray wolf introductions. And, and then the region. So we're the Northeastern region. But you can sign up for all regions, right? You can sign up for everything if you want, if you want to get all the information. But, you know, I define what I want to get, get hit subscribe. Next thing I know, the next e news that comes out, I get in my email. Right? So, anyway, really simple process. Um, I suggest you be, I suggest everyone do that. It's a great way to keep yourself informed of what's happening across everything happening at CBW. Okay? Cool. Thank you. All right. With that, um, I want to introduce our first speaker. So, our first speaker is uh, William DC. He's a uh, ecologist at Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, where he works on research and management of elk and, and moose. Uh, from 2019 to 2023, he was a brown bear and adult sheep biologist for the Arctic National uh, Park Space in Fairbanks, Alaska. Before that, he opened up research on brown bear and sound ecology in Kodiak, Alaska. He, uh, in 2016, he earned his PhD in systems ecology from the University of Montana in Missouri. And, and this one. I was the one that was very curious about what was going on with health management and vegetative management in Rocky Mountain National Park. It started about in the early 2000s when some of the elk were overabundant in the park, especially in the winter areas. And there were meetings at the Estes Park with DOW at the time and all the park officials, and they came up with three or four different alternatives to how to control the elk population. And a lot of, some of it was controversial and some of it was not. And so finally they came up with a plan to how to call elk out using citizens uh, calling groups and a variety of other methods. So I was curious about where is that today as far as management of the park, how many of that were actually called, are they still doing that? And then CSU developed a contraceptive for a call out at that time in connection with chronic waste disease. And how is that being developed today? And is it being used that I got to place? I can answer this question. Yeah, I appreciate the invitation. Happy you all came out on the table for us. Uh, I'm just going to get a brief overview and then hopefully we'll get some time for questions. But first, I'm going to start um, by a quick history of Elkin and Rocky Mountain National Park. I'm going to talk about our current management plan and then uh, we'll go over some winter elk population estimates. And finally, I'll talk about the management tools that we have at our disposal in the park. So, health management has evolved in the park as uh, scientific understanding has changed and also just uh, public perceptions of different tools that we have have changed. You know, probably most of you know that uh, health were extricated from the park from market hunting in the 1800s, and then they were reintroduced in 1913 and 1914, just before the park was created. Population boom, and then starting in the late 40s, the Park Service was doing population control. So they were doing polling and also uh, capturing and relocating elk outside of the park. And then nationwide, you know, perceptions about management for polling changed, and uh, the Park Service, like across the entire country, switched to this era of what they call natural regulation. The idea is you just let natural processes regulate the elk population. Uh, you know, we had no hunting here, pulling stock, and then we had no predators. We still have no predators um, in the area. And so um, you know, this caused problems for us. We saw a huge boom over abundance of elk during this time. In the late 1990s, in the park, um, we had scenes like this. So we have this huge density of elk in these areas that used to be riparian, uh, you know, willow, aspen communities. The population was larger, not migrating as much as normal and more concentrated than it would be in a more natural system that we had all the others around the At the peak, the winter population in Rocky Mountain National Park and then in the Estes Park below, probably for all the winter there, was 2,700 to 3,400. And the 
proportionate density is greater than 100 like per, per square mile, per, per square kilometer, which is the highest densities everywhere except for the Delta and the Delta key. So highest densities in many places except for the artificial key. And then a bunch of those are also staying there year round, not migrating down in elevation in the winter and not migrating up in the summer. So the areas where they're concentrating is this outline in red. I'm sure a lot of you have been to these areas, so it's just the low mountain meadows just west of this park. So we saw big impacts of vegetation because of that concentration. So in the in the winter, it often happens <coughs> the grasses and fields that they've been grazing on. And so, so instead they're hitting willows and they're also having big impacts on aspen. So aspen, you weren't getting any regeneration, and so you, the, the worry was that you lose those aspen. So because of all this stuff, the Park Service created the Elk and Vegetation Management Plan. Um, you know, like Paul said, it was this plan to deal with these issues. And we call it EDP for short. And it was a long period of research, period of planning, where there was public comment periods where getting soliciting um, people's opinions about, about different options. And then now we're in the implementation phase. It started in 2008, we're on year 15 of the plan. And first 20 years will wrap up in, in 2028. And the key thing is it's an adaptive management plan. Instead of like having prescriptions about what we're going to do every single year, we have goals and then we have tools and we can adjust and use the tools as we need. Every single year we're collecting data to make sure that we're heading in the right direction and we adjust uh, year on year. So the main goals were to reduce the impacts of outcome vegetation because we wanted to improve the And then we wanted to limit the elk, number of elk on winter range to a maximum of 800, and then continue to provide uh, elk feeding opportunities as well. So in terms of elk management tools that I'm going to talk about, I'll go through each of these. The big one is fencing on the winter range, and then fertility reduction, which is what Paul mentioned, polling, and finally redistribution by hazing. So the most successful tool that we use is habitat fencing. And this is just basically what it sounds like. We, we put exposure fences up to a home, and it's to exclude an elk from these uh, low riparian areas where they're just over and over being hammered and low. And it just keeps them away and makes <coughs> that vegetation come back for a period of time. So fences are high enough that other animals, including deer, can go underneath, and people are <coughs> So this area, this is uh, Essex Park on the right here in, in yellow, um, and these red shapes are showing where there's fencing on the landscape now. So they were installed 2008 to 2014, and it's about 6% of the east side of the winter range that's fenced. You'd think it would be a lot more than that, just if you, if you move very through the park, because they're all down near the roads, because that's the roads, we build roads where it's convenient to have. Uh, but it's really only about 6% of the winter range. <coughs> then the next uh, tool we had is, is that we tested was fertility control. This is an experimental experiment that occurred 2008 to 2011. The Park Service and CSU captured 60 cows. Half were given uh, this fertility agent, Conicon. It was determined that Conicon was really effective. None of the cows in the first year were pregnant, and uh, most were not pregnant for the second year. But even with one to two years, it was, we determined that it was too invasive, too time intensive, too costly to, to use that to regulate the populations. And so that, you know, that's a tool that we, that we haven't used since then. The next tool that we had access to was uh, Colin. And the idea there is pretty obvious just to reduce the number of elk in the park. Uh, qualified hunters were interviewed, so a picture of these interviews that happened, and uh, selected and then trained. And the idea was to select hunters that had you know, a really strong conservation ethic, um, good marks 
craftsmanship, we're okay. We fall in the direction from our folks, and um, you know we're okay. Harvesting these animals, processing them, and then the meat was uh, you know, taken and given to the community members. Out there was tested for, for composting. As I said, the goal was to limit health to less than 800 on the winter range. And so every single year, we would estimate the number of the winter range. And the way we do that is uh, volunteers drive these road surveys. This is pretty different than how elk are estimated in the city or else you know, where you go fixed wing or a helicopter and estimate across a large area. We're dealing with a really small area that's very well covered by roads. So those estimates are all the whole accounts would go into. Um, a model that estimates the population. <coughs> and here we're looking at data from you know, about 1970 through 2000, and the yellow line is showing our winter population limits. You can see most of those years the population is above our limit. And then if we add the rest of the data here, you can see the winter population has gone way down. spending as much time in this concern area uh, on the winter range. And I'm sure you know CPW's graphs of the population here, they do not, not look like this. They do not crash down like that. It's, it's really important to know to know that this is just like uh, the amount of elk in a very small area at a very specific time in the winter. And really, you know, this is more about um, changing the Since they were introduced, the more likely they are to migrate. So the idea there is that they take some time for them to sample their environment, move around, and try to think, and it takes a little time for them to figure out what's like the adaptive strategy for migration. And it's possible that this has happened with this population since they were reintroduced in 1913, and maybe it took about a hundred years for them to figure it out. It's also possible that some of those management actions we were taking the following the fencing was signal that this isn't a place to hang out all winter long at, you know, 8,000 feet instead of going to the lower location. And then it's not the focus of this talk, but we are seeing big improvements in the habitat. We're getting a lot more real growth, a lot more aspen growth. But surprisingly, considering how few elk are on the winter, or are there in the winter, most of the benefits that we're seeing are inside these fences. It doesn't really take an analysis. You can just go drive up there and Then uh, just to wrap up the future of health management, the plan is uh, you know the, the the park service planning process usually is maxed out of about 20 years, and so that's why the 20 years was chosen. It's not like in 2020 we're going to pull all the fences out because we don't want to backslide into all the habitat improvements that we have. Um, likely the the goals will stay the same. But as I 
I said before, it's an adaptive management plan. If we start seeing it going in the wrong direction, then um, the actions we're taking are likely to change. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Any idea what the CWD rate was on the animals that were called? I'm not sure about the animals that were called. I can't tell you that at the time, it was, it was much, much higher. And we've seen it come way down. So three buzzwords that really perturbed the sports people in Colorado when they were developing these plans was possibility. Goals, so pro wolf people came to the meetings and said this would be a natural thing for wolves to come and call these elk down in a natural way. Uh, federal sharpshooters, over a 19, 20 year period, spending $15 million to call off up to 200 elk a year if needed, cow elk, and then bury the parts in the park. Waste was some of the responses to that. Uh, and then cow out contraception. Now, BOW never said we will never use that on wild herds, but they did it in the park just as an experiment. And luckily, they came out with a reasonable method of culling the elk and did reasonable research and developed their vegetative plant, which was much they needed. Bill Vaughn, I believe, was the superintendent of the park at that time. Bill Vaughn, Bill Bates. Vaughn Baker was the superintendent back then. He wrote an op-ed in the Denver Post saying, wolves won't work in Rocky Mountain National Park like they did in, because this ain't Yellowstone. Because he talked about the people surrounding the National Park, uh, the wildlife, the domestic animals, and he said, wolves know no boundaries. So they could have spread anywhere. So luckily that didn't happen. I just wanted to add that to the Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and part of that, as Rex read a bit about what was going on at that time, and the idea was that they would kill wolves in the park, and then if they tried to, if they were leaving, they would go and capture them, and then they, they turned turn yeah. out they killed them. Yeah, so there were four options that were considered, and the one the plan that we had before was the of those other things were. So, so you said the, the data showed that in Estes Valley and Park, there was a drop, a significant drop off in the population. And you said that herd is, is about the same. So, in the DAU, is that, I mean, it's the same number of animals, they've just migrated to different locations. Yeah, that's, that's you know, it's actually mostly the same frame herd. And Yeah, cur currently we're definitely yeah. within objective. The interesting thing was, you know, through the late 90s, the herd kind of peaked in 1999, just under like, just over 4,000, between 4,000 and 4,000. And then you started having these congregations in the park in the late 90s, and that's kind of what's the antithesis of all this. Um, to date, well, I guess, I guess starting in like 98, 99, we started cranking up the off tag, and we brought that down to somewhere in the 3,000s, you know, by 2000. Seven or nine. Um, one interesting thing is that on that second or third year of coaling, we had a really big winter right after that, 2010 to 11, and that combined with with you know the second or third year of pressure from that from those shooters um, helped push a lot of elk down. When they went down, um, you know south of 34, they they stayed. They started doing it again the next year, the next year, the next year. Um, so that so there was kind of some help by other nature that helped in our opinion. I think this like like help push it down. So I thought that was pretty interesting. <clears throat> what is the impact of those elk going down? I mean, is that is that all in forest yet, or is that uh, down to private property? Uh, yes, I, I suppose. Uh, Mark, you could probably talk about that a little bit. So once those elk started migrating, the northern group, north of 34, they always had a little bit of migration there. That southern group, south of 34, um, they do come down, and they, they get down near um, just to the now they're at the edge of Loveland after after the, the development of that reservoir right now. Um, and starting in probably 2010 to 12, now the local EWM is a lot more complex on small pasture agriculture um, and organelles. So it does happen, but um, we don't have large scale you know, 
ag out there are, are significantly on board. But I'm sure when you get something there, you can ask all that detail just a little bit what the dumps are doing and what else should be. I was an area wildlife manager in that Loveland area from 02 to 08, so that's <coughs> what I'm curious about. I will say one thing that happened. Push a lot of dogs down into that level area. These drought conditions in you know, O2. It was, it was a severe drought here, and a lot of those elk moved down along the Devil's Backbone into that part of the, the west side of Loveland. And then they didn't all go back the next spring to calf. And I think a bunch of them calf, a bunch of those cows calf in that area. And so we started having more elk issues in and around Loveland, in, in town, out on you know, First Street. Town and that's the park. It's not a lot, it's maybe two to three hundred. Um, but we don't, when, when Parks and Wildlife, when we do our winter out surveys, in the Northeast region, we do mostly drive surveys. We can't fly, we have a lot of fencing and, and housing. We can't, we can't fly fixed wings, we can't fly helicopters for help. Um, we do big ground counts, big ground count efforts in late January and February. Um, most of those elk are, are bunched down and we can count a lot of them. So we get really good classification data. Um, this herd is in a good spot right now. Unit 20 is, is a very good unit. <coughs> an objective. And I think we're kind of in a good spot right now. Our throttle on this herd is really this PLO cow tags. That's how we really can, can regulate where we're at on the population. Um, it's, it's really a gym, a front range gym. I think I'm going to start it off. Yeah. yeah, so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we just had kind of a show of hands, but just to get a better gauge. So 
some of you may have come because of the hunting, but you may also fish. So like, how many people are anglers in the room? I just showed up for fishing. Okay. Does that mean you catch fish or you just, you just go? There's a follow up question. Just go. Get a line with All right, keep your hand up there for a minute. Anglers, just total anglers. All right. How many people fish cold water and warm water? Anybody just, oh, so that answers my question. So everybody's fishing for everything, that's great. Uh, cool, all right, last, I think, survey question. If you could place yourself in the three, one of three categories, as like a novice, mediocre angler, or like, pretty dang good at what I do. Um, and for me personally, like, and this isn't just years of angling, I would say like, you know, I'm a pretty poor angler, that's why. You're lucky that I'm allowed to use like build up some electricity to stir it. I put myself in the lower end of like mediocre. But so how many like novice anglers do we have out there? Okay. Yeah. How about like mediocre? Okay. How about like you're you're kind of at the top tier? And there's people here that are. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we have some fairly honest people in the room. So thank you. Yeah, so the Northeast Aquatics team is made up of, I'm the Northeast Senior Aquatic Biologist. I will be fairly new to this role. Uh, and then we have six other biologists within Northeast Aquatics that are out on the ground managing those actual fisheries. So in terms of what that manage and what, or what we do in terms of fishery management, that's covering anything that is a public water body in the entire Platte River Basin. So that's, we cover North Park and the headwaters of the North Platte. We cover the Poudre River, the Laramie. Ben's covering the Big Thompson, St. Frame, Boulder, <coughs> that watershed. We have the biologists out of Denver who's, coming, who's covering like the metro area and the I-70 corridor, Care Creek, Care Creek. And then a South Park biologist who's covering the headwaters of the South Platte. And then a biologist out east. Um, she's based out of Brush and she's covering what kind of everything, including Jackson Reservoir East. And then we have one uh, native aquatic species biologist that, as you can imagine, focuses primarily on native aquatic species. So, in terms of kind of what we do within that management, I was the area aquatic biologist based on Fort Collins, so I covered the Pooter, the Laramie, and the North Flat during my time there. That consisted of managing, my management area included 817 unique water codes. So a water code being like Horse Tooth Reservoir is one water code. A three acre pond in Fort Collins is one water code. The Cooter River might be probably around like 10 different water codes. Um, so pretty big geographic areas. And then what does fishery management mean? You know, Will was talking a little bit about the toolbox and Mark mentioned the toolbox. Kind of look at the fishery management toolbox, if you will, really kind of lump things into four different categories of like stocking, regulations, habitat manipulation, and then removal of un un unwanted species. So those are really like the four main ways that I would say we, we are able to manipulate a fishery and push it in one direction or the other for different reasons. The first one was, anybody remember? Stocking. 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 So, <clears throat> over under, do you think we stock greater than, raise your hand if you think greater than 20 million fish in the world? All sizes, all species. Greater than 20 million. Uh, ben raised his hand, so you guys should all be raising your hand. <laughs> um, yeah, so few stats, 60.8 million fish were stocked in the Northeast region in 2022. That covered 25 different species, ranging from northern red belly dace, a native aquatic species, uh, you know, walleye, wiper, and that's walleye at fry size, so literally a quarter of an inch. Um, it's walleye at two inches, that's including rainbow trout at 10 inches. But a lot of fish are going out the door. That seems like an astronomical number, but like when you're stocking 3.6 million fry and horse tooth, walleye fry and horse tooth, those, those add up. Um, and with that, in terms of like stocking, in the Northeast region, we manage a lot of brood waters. So, with brood water, some of these species <coughs> we stock, we actually go out into wild populations and spawn fish to take eggs, to bring them into a hatchery, to raise them, to then go out and stock them. So the Northeast region probably has the, mo 
most of it's been done in the amount, but it's got to be the most of it in terms of brood waters. Um, we manage 13 different water bodies and brood lakes covering eight different species. So that's kokanee, walleye, sauger, grayling, greenback, cutthroat trout. Um, so eight different species there. And then one of the other big tools I just wanted to touch on briefly, and then we'll get into kind of like some specific water bodies and certainly entertain some questions. Um, regulations is a big one that's out there though as a management tool. And we use very specific regulations and very specific interests in instances to achieve an ultimate management strategy or steer that fishery um, in a direction or at least put some side words on it. Um, and they're very specific to a water body. So if you look at even, you know, like walleye regulations, we have very different, we have different walleye regulations that Cherry Creek and Chatfield is brood water than we do out on the eastern plains of water bodies that are managed for more harvest and recreation. Um, and a number of factors go into those kind of regulations. You know, what are the true management goals? Is it brood water or are you managing it for harvest? Does it go dry every five years potentially? So, you know, protecting fish up until year eight probably doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, how to manage the water in the Laramie River Valley that you can put a 10 inch rainbow in in May and it'd be 18 inches by the beginning of ice fishing season. Phenomenal growth rates and you know there would always be questions about this should be a catch and release fishery. 70% of the winter is up in the winter field. So like finding that balance between like allowing people to harvest fish, fish and you know providing that opportunity versus you know just trying to grow 24 inch rainbow trout everywhere. Probably not going to live long enough. So, yeah, we can talk more about regulations um, if you want on specific ones, but kind of looking at like two in particular with walleye, you look at a Cherry Creek Reservoir. That one is a three bag limit over 18 inches where only one of those can be taken at that are 21 inches or greater. We also have a closure along the dam during the spawn to protect mainly our nets so we can effectively conduct the walleye spawn operation. That's why we supply walleye eggs to every other in the, in the basin. That 18 inch minimum, pretty specific because it takes, you know, three to four years for a walleye to get up to 18 inches. What are like the biggest cohort of the fish we spawn? Three and four year old walleye. So if you had a 15 inch regulation in there, you know, some of those fish would be getting harvested before we even have a chance of spawning them. So they're not really meeting the management objective there at Cherry versus like a jumbo reservoir, where you look at a minimum size for walleye and saw guy is 15 inches, and only one in aggregate longer than 21 statewide bag and possession limits apply of five and 10 and respectively. So there, regulations are a little bit looser. We keep fish at 15 inches or bigger, trying to meet the management objective there of allowing some harvest and giving anglers a chance to go out and catch and keep walleye. Um, so, we should open it up to questions there. Let's go through a few. I had a few select kind of water bodies for updates. Um, I want to certainly save some time for, for questions. So in terms of the Poudre River, you know, that one, Cameron Peak Wildfire hit in 2020, over 209,000 acres, a lot of which was in the Poudre River Basin. Fast forward one year into 2021, and we had some monsoon rain events that led to debris flows and really decimated the Poudre River fishery from Black Hollow Creek confluence for 20 miles downstream, like that lead pipe, like clearly killed the fish for 20 miles. And those impacts were seen not as drastically, but as far down as like 40 miles downstream all the way through Fort Collins. So pretty big hit to the Poudre River fishery. Since then, and starting in the fall of 2020, that was in July, I'm sorry, July of 2021, we started that rebuilding effort. That effort is focused on Whirling disease resistant rainbow trout to try to establish uh, the rainbow trout population in the Poudre River before the brown trout come back in mass and kind of dominate that fishery. <coughs> we'll see too early to tell how successful that's going to be, but that's kind of the trajectory for that one, stocking rainbows. Numbers are increasing, but it's you know it's going to take some time to rebuild 20 miles of fishery. Uh, we'll jump down to like Denver, Chatfield. So that one is one of our walleye brood lakes. 
you know, I feel like that one just kind of highlights some of the complexities in management in terms of what you stock, when you stock, how they do. And that one has seen pretty variable recruitment over the years. We stocked a mix of fry and fingerling walleye in there. We've done only fry one year, we've done only fingerling one year, trying to evaluate kind of what, what is working and what doesn't. A lot of things go into like what works and what doesn't go. So we want to if you stock fry and get a lizard two weeks later, you might not have a lot of success out there recruitment out of that plant. Um, so Chatfield numbers are overall down in general. We have done a lot of looking into why that is and they're really kind of narrowing on there's something going on with limitations in recruitment. Usually it seems like in that first year of life you don't get Chatfield. So still trying to work through that one. Cherry Creek numbers are really high. Um, and kind of that deep dive into like evaluating that um, you know, we were comparing Cherry Creek and Chatfield and you find things like Cherry Creek has three times the number of plankton levels at the same time of year as, as Chatfield. So certainly there can be, can be some things going on there. Horse tooth was one other one that I wanted to give an update on. How many of you guys fish horse tooth? Okay. Um, so horse tooth is a kind of a long, interesting saga in terms of fishery management. We brought smelt in in the 90s, smelt boomed and busted, and walleye kind of followed with the boom and bust pattern. Smelt showed back up in 2010, and the walleye fishing and recruitment kind of followed quickly behind with that added prey base. The walleye did really well, they grew really fast. We had pretty good recruitment, and the walleye fishing was good. Since then, the walleye numbers have definitely been dropping off a little bit. It seems like there are two just kind of general recruitment issues. Uh, we did. Previously, we hadn't been stocking walleye in horse two. So we have started now stocking walleye as of 2021 in horse two, 3.6 million fry to kind of try to help out and supplementally stock on top of that natural reproduction. We're seeing some success from that, uh, but certainly in an older population in horse two reservoir. So that's one, you know, when you look at regulations, certainly going to be looking at the potential for regulation in there to kind of Standing stock. Um, the last one I kind of wanted to touch on briefly. Anybody fish Lake John? I do. A lot. A lot. All right. Well, it'll be brief since it's only one in the room. Uh, so Lake John is one up in North Park. Uh, pretty popular recreational fishery up there. We stock around 400,000 sub catchables, so three to five inch rainbow trout. Um, go into Lake John annually. That lake, we had a really big, long winter in North Park this past year, ice on in like November and ice off in May, so seven months of ice. Led to pretty uh, poor conditions under the ice at the end of that season when we had a partial winter kill um, out at Lake John. So we're also kind of in a rebuilding phase there. That one, you can rebuild those fisheries a little bit faster with any green book out than you can you know, stop and walleye for it doesn't appear so. We also did some sampling at, at the Delaney's, the south and east lake were, were fine, and it looks like the north lake is okay. They have a little bit better oxygen levels coming out of it. So those were kind of brief updates. I just wanted to highlight a few, and I'm going to turn it over to Ben to highlight a couple in his management area. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm here basically because I, I noticed on the agenda, Boyd Lake and Union Reservoir. Um, I didn't have any particular specifics, but uh, if anybody had questions about those particular two reservoirs, um, I, I'm, I'm here to answer those questions. I will say, um, you know, Kyle touched on it, but I think of fisheries management as a pyramid. At the base of the pyramid, you have the habitat. And in my opinion, it's more important than fish stocking, it's more important than regulations because the habitat includes the water, the vegetation, the oxygen, and then on top of it, our hatchery system is one of the best in the nation, but we, you know, we're dealing with animals. A lot of times we'll get a thunderstorm. This year we drained the pond to Pueblo, brought in 100,000 walleye fingerlings, got a hailstorm. We lost everything out of that pond. So um, fish availability, we're good, but sometimes we're not that good. You know, it's still an environmental situation so 
we've got to build the base of the habitat, we've got to rely on our hatchery system for the particular species like the wiper and the walleye that don't reproduce naturally very well in our systems. And if we can get those two in place, then it makes sense to add fishing regulations um, to kind of as an icing on the cake. And our regulation at Boyd is you can have five fish, five walleye, um, 15 inch minimum, only one over um, 21. It's not self-sustaining. It requires stocking every year. And this year, for the first time in the past four years, I got my full complement of my request, which was 76,000 1.25 inch walleye, 14,000 in, 14,000 uh, fingerling sogai and two million sogai fry. Um, we went through a year of COVID in 2020 where we didn't stock any walleye. We didn't do the operation. So that suffered a little bit and I, I'm, I'm assuming the, what the question was, we'd like to reduce the number of walleye potentially out of void. I don't have support for that from my data. And I don't have support for that from my state parks folks. Um, visitation at Boyd has gone down relative to 2020 and 2021. Um, again, I mentioned um, I got my full complement of, of requests this year. We also, we also just changed two specific fishing regulations at Horseshoe and Lake Loveland to mirror the same regulation at Boyd. Not necessarily a, a biological regimen, Regulation is more to assist the parks. A lot of folks would claim they were fishing in a horse tube, walk over to Boyd, and say, "Well, I, I've got you know, you know, fish under 15 inches um, because I was fishing in a horseshoe." Well, they can't claim that now. That's only been in, implemented for two years. We do have some uh, transfer of fish from Lake Loveland into Horseshoe, ultimately into Boyd. So I'd like you know a couple more years of. Uh, to see whether or not that normalizes things. I will say the number of walleye in my gillnets is slightly down relative to 2020, but I believe that's environmental related. And like I said, the water availability, lack of that one year where we didn't stock, um, a return to normal use in terms of anglers. And also Kyle and I rely heavily on creel data I mean, if we interview anglers, determine the harvest, and not only Boyd, but Jackson, Sterling, Pruitt, Jumbo, the number of anglers that actually catch five fish and harvest five fish, it's less than 5% of people that are out there angling. So I'm really hesitant to change any fishing regulations on Boyd. Now, the other one that came up was Union. Um, Union Reservoir is in Longmont, uh, just to the west of State Brain State Park. It was traditionally managed as a wiper fishery. Wipers are a hybrid striped bass, just like walleye, they have a really tough time reproducing. We rely on out-of-state trades from Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas to get those fish. Um, my opinion, it's the hardest warm water species to raise. You've got a 20 minute window to fertilize the eggs. And after that, you're done. They won't accept sperm and you're out of luck. So for five or six years, we, um, we had no luck getting out of state trades. So we pivoted and, and at Union, we started going with walleye. Um, it took off and, and quite frankly, it's done quite well. And that was already on our radar. Um, the number, the abundance of walleye in Union is the highest it's ever been. Um, the wiper are back, and those numbers are way up as well. There is a 15 inch minimum on the wiper, but like I said, traditionally, it was a wiper fishery, and we didn't look at the walleye. Now, last year, um, you know, we caught, I think it was like 203 walleye and five gillnet, which is, it rivals anywhere in the state. It's great. Um, but I did look at the data, and, and uh, guys uh, and gals, the data is online, so if you wanted to look up the, my data and look at the link frequencies, just type in Union Reservoir Swiggle or Boyd Lake Swiggle. All the data is there. Um, the link frequency distribution on walleye in Union suggests a regulation may be effective. Uh, there's very few fish over 15 inches. 
Um, so what, what we did this year, uh, after we pulled the nest last year, we instigated a creel survey. Um, it, it is being ran by the rangers at Union Reservoir. Um, one of the guys there is named Roy. He's a huge walleye angler, and he instantly wanted to change the regulation when, when the walleye really picked up. Well, it's like, Roy, let me really in here. Let's get an idea of what we actually are, har what the harvest is. Is it harvest? Why we're not seeing fish over that 15? Or is it survivability? Is it a habitat thing? So we instigated a creel to determine exactly what it, it, what it is, and that's ongoing right now. Um, we basically interview anglers, determine how, many, how long have you fished, and um, what's your harvest? And from that, we can determine total number of fish that are coming out of there. Is that sustainable? Probably not. Well, we want to find out before we make a regulation change. And then, in addition, we're asking the anglers, um, what species are you primarily fishing for? And, you know, I gave them, like, three choices, walleye, wiper, catfish, or crappie. Um, so, before we go and change the reg, I want to make sure we're not stealing from Paul to pay Kyle, you know, so to speak. Maybe, maybe the anglers there really do prefer the wiper. And in general, when you pass a regulation to protect one species, you usually, it diminishes the other predator. Um, like when I see walleye expand in Boyd, the white bass population falls back drastically. Right now, the white bass and void are at an all-time high, probably because we missed that 2020 stocking. So, um, it's a work in progress at Union. When I have the results of the creel, Roy's here, I noticed. Um, and when I have the results of the creel and results from this fall's gillnet survey, we'll revisit that and implement a regulation change if it makes sense. But, I, you know, the question is still out there and we're collecting the data to try and determine that. So. Like, like Kyle said, I, I am Fort Collins, the boulder, up to the continental divide, so anything in that neck of the woods you have questions about, I'd be happy to answer, but I, I just wanted to touch on those two waters because it was on the agenda. So I have a quick question. The fishing ladder you put in at Watson Lake, have you been able to assess the efficiency of or effectiveness of that? Yeah, so the question was, we put in a fish passage structure at Watson Lake. Um, yeah, so that one was in my management area. And yes, we have uh, assessed it to a certain degree. We haven't gone out and like tagged 10,000 fish or anything like that, but we did an initial tagging of a couple hundred, just in a range of species that you can't really see in that stretch of the finger. And we are trying to accommodate passage for fish passage, meaning there, there's a what, like six, seven foot tall concrete inverted structure that supplies water to the hatchery. No fish since that structure was built in the 60s have been able to make it up past that divergent structure to move upstream. We put in a fish ladder, and it is what it sounds like to allow fish to swim upstream and get above that diversion structure. So those species we were primarily looking at were ground trout, ringwood trout, longnose sucker, white sucker, and at least adults of all of those species have been able to navigate the ladder. So. And so they mostly go up on private land, so is that a spawning effect that they go up there to do? Is that your goal? Because once they get up into the canyon, there's another big dam there they can't get over. Yeah, it turns out getting water on the rivers is a pretty important thing around Colorado. Um, and, you know, can pose problems to fish, like you just described. Something like, you know, Gateway Park, I-25, I think there's 18 channel spanning structures. So, <coughs> Look at the long, long term. It, it's a long term game to play. Um, so we've expanded them another two miles. You know what the fish tend to do with it. Now the choice is up to them. And that lower section in town, even in that reach, I mean, flows get pretty low. The flows get low. Water temperatures increase. There's all oxygen decreases. And it becomes pretty uncomfortable in town if you're a rainbow trout or even a brown trout. And so the natural way to get out of that is to try to move upstream. If you don't have the ability to, then there's certainly years, you know, down lower in the Tudor River and a lot of front range swimming where trout members suffer as a result of this environmental condition. So. And one more question about Douglas Lake north of Fort Collins. What, what has happened in the past couple of years and what is planned <coughs> as far as wipers, walleye, trout? Yeah, so Douglas Reservoir north of town, uh, in west of Wellington, it's a 
State Wildlife Area property. That one we started in like 2010. The management there took a direction to establish a sauger brood stock there. We use sauger to make saw guy in the state. We generally rely on Nebraska or and or Kansas to get sauger milk, a mix of our female walleye eggs to make saw guy. Douglas was chosen just so we can have an in-state backup sauger. So we've been focused, I mean, since then on managing that sauger population. Sauger, sauger population does pretty well. Sauger are like the little brother of the walleye, I would call them. They top out in Douglas around like 18 inches. So we have pretty good numbers of sauger. The, with establishing that, we planted a couple of year classes of wiper in there. There are wiper in there. Recently? Um, 2016 okay. and just last year. So we have like 18 to 25 inch wiper, not in huge numbers, but accessible things. And then trout? Trout gets stocked in there, both catchable, catchable trout being a 10 inch trout, a sub catchable trout being like three to five inches. Um, we stock both catchables and sub catchables in there. They do okay. Send you there is like the best front range trout fishing. Um, but they're in there, the ice fishermen generally get into them relatively well. Douglas is, I, a gym, I would say, I put it in the category of a generally hard reservoir to fish. How many people fish Douglas? Okay. Yeah, I'd like trout fishers. It's good early and it's good late, like with a lot of water bodies as it warms up this time of year, the fishing all over just gets hard. If you don't have a boat, I would say Douglas is. I don't want to cover it now. I'll have a personal conversation about Lake John and stickleback minnows and the loss of damsel flies and larvae. Okay. Uh, but I'll, I'll, we'll do that on one-on-one. -on -one. Sounds good. Okay. So let's kind of open it up to open it up to questions. Is Big Creek Lakes in your area? Yes. Uh, just came from there two weeks ago. Twenty fishermen on the lake. I saw one fish leave the lake. Everybody was pretty upset and left and said they'd never come back. What was that a winter for? kill? What are you fishing for? Um, large, um, lake trout. That's what was up there primarily before. Yeah, and there's still lake trout in there. The fishing in for lake trout is like pretty good right after ice off, which up there is like end of May, early June time period. Um, I mean, I would say fishing pressure has definitely increased at Big Creek over the last 10 to 15 years for sure. Uh, kind of word got out on that one. Um, I mean, there's still lake trout in there. The folks that I have talked to early in the season did relatively well. Um, we also managed that one for tiger muskie. Also pretty decent tiger muskie in there. Okay. In the back. First, Ben, thank you for all your help and assistance. We really appreciate it. Um, I had another question that I've been wondering. The wiper limit is 10, and just from my experience checking fishermen and everything, it seems like there's a certain population of people that only catch 10 that fish every single day. It's too hard for you guys that don't have the resources to see what their possession is. But why can't we make it five? I mean, you yourself said how hard it is to get wiper and raise wiper. But the limit of 10, 15 inch wiper from what I've been checking is about 1.5, 1.7 pounds each. And that's 17 pounds of fish. And I don't think really anybody needs to walk most of the lake day after day with 17 pounds of fish. And even our game wardens are really frustrated because they can't do anything about it. They're short-handed and they said it requires a huge investigation to follow them. And they'll admit to you that they sell them at the, at the markets. So why is it 10? It just seems unreasonable. They're the only ones day after day. It's really frustrating. Like the same people there day after day? Or what do you yeah, well, it's the same people, same group. We didn't have to close off one end of our lake because we can focus on that end. There's so much going on with the fence. And it seems like any place there's white or even when I talk to Lawrence in Nebraska, it's the same situation. But when the limit is 10, it encourages the commercial fishing to see. Yeah, to be honest with you, I, 
I don't know where the bag limit on Swiper of 10 came from, but let's, for example, if we come back this fall and we capture more Wiper than we did last fall, say abundance increased, but we get an idea of what your harvest is, and we can potentially adjust that. So, if, you know, if we have an idea of what your harvest is, and we see a drastic decline in the number of fish in our nets, and then we'll, we'll be able to say definitively that that's having an impact. I don't want to pass a regulation change if the data doesn't support it, basically. Okay, but the data is going to be skewed because we shut down the one portion of the lake where they were all taking all the fans, and we'd like to open that back up. So I, it's, I was just curious why we have to have a limb so high with 17 pounds of fish a day. And that's just for the minimum size. I'm not going to disagree with you on that one, but um, it's something we haven't looked at in a while and it brings to light that maybe we need to discuss our bag of possession limits. So in, in general, I know the, the five, five walleye limit is something where um, you can feed a family like four to six. You know, ten wiper. Um, it, it probably also goes back to a lot of our species are in aggregate. So, in a lot of a lot of like like John Martin has has wiper and white bass. When you put those in aggregate, ten sure. ten white bass at ten inches each. Right. That's a meal, but it may not have wiper. So, and then it goes back to identification. Most people can't tell the difference between a wiper, a striped bass, and, and a white bass. So, right. yeah. just just for comment, John Martin, the limit's twenty. That that's the southeast region. Yep. And so, they, in certain species, they have different limits. But so, John Martin, where they have both of them, the limit actually is twenty. In aggregate. So, with twenty white bass, you're probably looking. We just, yeah, a lot of the fish movement leaders openly admit that they go to the markets. Okay. Where, where are we at on our time, Ken? One lake with that? Yeah, I mean, we're. Yeah. All, it's all, I mean. It's yeah, it's probably time for one more question. Yeah, one or two more questions at the most. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, what's the, uh, any update on Zimmerman? Uh, as a brood lake, and uh, is there any any uh, regulation changes going to happen uh, with respect to long drum? Oh boy! How much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> Zimmerman numbers are still down, so Zimmerman, if you don't know, up towards the top of Cameron Pass, it is our green back cutthroat trout brood lake. Um, we also spawn them in, in a couple hatcheries. Um, numbers have been down. We increase the stocking density. There's a little bit last year, there was a little bit of a bump. In that year class coming up, they're only one year old, so we're not to the spawning stage by any means yet. They first recruited at age three for cutthroat trout up there. So yeah, that one is still a bit of a mystery to be honest. I think it's a number of different factors from, you know, can't harvest fish, so that one's kind of out. But um, avian predation, fish leaving the lake from through the outlet structure, uh, potentially, the other one we looked at was dissolved oxygen this year. We snowshoe in there in like the end of April. There's still 36 inches of ice and a lot of snow. Um, so that was one we previously hadn't considered, but probably could be could be one of the signs that I'd say we solved that mystery. Yeah, okay. The other one was long draw. Um, part of the Pooter Headwater projects, we stock it with historically recreational grade cutthroat trout. Um, it will, years down the road, become a greenback cutthroat trout fishery. And hopefully a brood water, when that happens, that will go to catch and release fly and only uh, regulations. But we're going to have to remove the existing. Is there an increase the bag limit to let yeah. that happen? Yeah, we're going to, waiting on the timeline to really flesh itself out in that one. Um, we haven't done that just because it's still at least two, 
overall more like three to four years out. So once that long draw component of that greater project becomes like this is happening next year, then yeah, we'll probably, we will you know, release bank and possession limits on that. That's something we work through with the regional manager and all the law enforcement staff, but let the public come in and utilize the resources as much as we can. Kyle, thank you. Unfortunately, we have an hour worth of presentation. We have a half hour left. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. So 
you know, good voters are informed voters, and that's my intent here is just to share some information, share some history. I'm going to arrive at my own conclusions, but if you disagree with me, come see me afterwards because I'll arm wrestle. Big game season structure is about looking back as well as looking forward. And I want to describe some of the changes that were done five years ago. I was heavily involved in, in testifying. I was with the Bowhunters Association at the time. And so uh, let me kind of get into some of the things that happened. Uh, just a few quotes. Every uh, presentation needs quotes. Dan Prenslow, he said this many, many times. When we went totally limited on deer, we lost a ton of hunters and they never came back. Uh, last two nights ago, the southeast region, uh, the gal there on the, on the presentation said, we don't have enough data to suggest possible hunter application behavior when we take things limited. I disagree with that and I'm going to share that data. Uh, last night, uh, the Parks and Wildlife in the Northwest region responded to a question and said, you know what, allocation is 75-25 in limited units. And it is, but that's not the whole story. And so looking back at the changes, and I know this might be kind of hard to see for some of the folks on the internet. Uh, my, uh, I passed out some handouts earlier. I don't know if everybody, everybody got them. My contact info is out there. If you want this information, get in touch with me. Steve, there will be, I've got it in the Google Drive. It's listed on Facebook. It's out there. And so at 2020, what we did is, and this is since the limitation of bale and eagle, we limited all these DAUs just for archers. And we created hunt codes, and we made folks apply. And so that's limited for both residents and non-residents. And so I just wanted to kind of go over what's happening with those units. And so quotas were reduced, hunters were forced to go elsewhere, and what happened is we created GMUs and hunt codes that are worth to the public zero preference points. You can draw all of these with zero preference points. But if you look at the draw and what is happening out there, even though the commission said, you know what, residents ought to get 75% of draw tags, this is the truth and this is the reality of what's going on in this zero point unit. And it's all because of the behavior and how hunters think. They all have preference points. Do you want to apply as a first choice and burn four, five, six or more preference point for a hunt code that's really worth zero? And that's what they're worth. And so what's going on, if you look at the resident draw rate in all of these units, the average is non-residents are getting 67% of the tags. Residents are ranging anywhere from getting 10% up to 55%. So we're really getting 33% of the tags in all these limited units. I find that alarming. And so I just want to share this data because as we look at BGSS, and the questions on the survey, it's, do you want more of this? Um, you know, I don't know what your opinion is, but you want to formulate it, you don't get involved and engage. Not at all. We want no more of that. Right. And so one of the questions is, should we limit more archery units? Should we limit more rifle units? And what, again, I think is going to happen is we're going to turn all those units into zero point units, and you're going to see this exact same. Yeah. You're presenting one year of data after a big change. Don't you think that hunters that used to use, used to hunt in here are eventually going to have new learning behavior and they're going to lose application numbers? Just 200 out of, you know, don't you think that's going to climb a little bit after people get burned one year? Well, so E16, uh, Vail, uh, Eagle, and Pitkin counties, that was the first domino to fall. And so, uh, you know, that has worked itself out. And some of these units, like the latest limitation was the Grand Mesa, E14. Now, E14 has leftover tags. And I want to state, you know, quotas are meant to be sold. That's how you manage game. And when you get to a point where all the applicants have drawn, you know, and there's leftovers, 
there's no residency requirement. But the thing that I would point out is look at what's happened, and it's attrition to me. In Unit 77, we went from 2,754 hunters. The new quote is 1,100, but only 176 residents applied as first choice hunt code. Um, and as you boil it all out, everybody drew at the second choice, right? And so we had 265 uh, residents draw, 800 non-residents drew, and it was filled out at second choice. Now, some of these also have left over some of the private land hunt codes, but you'll also look at these and see some oddities. For example, we're offering either sex tags on private land, but yet a public hunter, public land hunter, only gets to take a bull. It seems a little bit odd to me. I don't think it, just, it encourages public access to private lands. And so uh, I just wanted to touch on that. You know, this is a phenomenon that's occurring because of a behavior. When you have a non-resident, he might be applying in six different states. He's got six different piles of points that he's paying attention to. Where a resident, he's got Colorado. And that, that's what he's got. He's got three L points, and he values those points very differently. And so the question to all of you and the call to action is, you know, if you think this is right, say so on the survey. If you don't think it's right, say so on the survey. And, you know, the call to action in, in my mind, the Parks and Wildlife, to the BGSS team is, you know, was this your intent? Is this what the goal was? And if it wasn't, what are you going to do to fix it? Certainly one of the options moving forward is, you know, I would ask that the BGSS team comes up and fleshes out several scenarios where residents retain OTC hunting. Because what we're doing is we're sending residents away in droves. Some of them are going to a smaller OTC landscape. But as you look at the OTC landscape, residents are declining by 20% since 2014, and non-residents are growing, I think it's 28%. So, you know, residents, as we look at the threats to hunting, certainly some of them are com coming from the ballot. Residents are important. I mean, I get the economic impact and all of that, but I'm a resident, and I'm here to talk about residents. I just don't think this is right. So, next slide. Uh, Again, a couple of things that happens when you take a, an OTC unit limited, and you force hunters elsewhere, we sent 6,700 to 7,000 bow hunters into a much smaller landscape. And if the issue is crowding, like we had units 8081, 3,000 hunters, 2,000 of them were non-residents, and we're trying to decide, decide if crowding is an issue, why are we sending so many residents? I mean, it's still 67% uh, non-resident. Actually, it's 73% this year. So again, I just want to share this. And the other thing, again, the behavior is residents, only 20% of them are applying as a first choice. If we had 7,800 residents, only 20% of them put in as first choice. Whereas a non-resident, their behavior is 50% of them are flying as a first choice. And so this is based on data that I had historically as all of these were shut down because I was getting spreadsheets from the biologists at, at CPW. And again, is, is this what we want more of? That's the question. Um, Shannon touched base on, on uh, considerations. Option one is let's limit everything. And so if you limit both rifle and archery, then you're given 20% of your quota to landowners. And I'm in the landowner program. I know how it works. Uh, but that's off the top. Those are removed from the public draw. And that's only if landowner demand meets the quota. But you're still going to have a zero point unit. Non-residents will dominate the draw. And you're going to give uh, preference to non-residents and landowners. So I call this the couch option. It's option number one. 
because if this moves forward, you're going to be sitting on the couch. You're not going to be out of money. Uh, option number two, it's my personal preference, I'll be honest. I, nobody has ever told me as a resident, we have 300,000 L. Why can't I get an over-the-counter hunting license? I can if I'm a resident of Montana, I can in Wyoming, I can in New Mexico, I can in Utah. But we're moving towards a system where I can't here in Colorado. Uh, the third option is OTC with caps. And so, in theory, with OTC with caps, all the licenses could go to a non-resident. I mean, it's first come, first serve. There's no residency in the state. There's 340,000 preference points out there or 115,000 residents. Uh, if you look at what's happened, I don't think limiting more units is creating a reduction in point creep because the behavior is that nobody wants to spend points. Okay. Uh, and just to close things out and keep with my 10 minutes and kind of uh, end there and open it up to questions, we'll stop here. I have a dozen more slides that I can supply later, but it's a two, three hour conversation. Really, the call is do you want more of this? And so if you don't, or if you do, take the survey. We need people to be involved. BGSS 5, 10 years ago, there was a ton of people in the room. We can't let this slide, so thanks for the time. Steve, is this all being driven by supposed overcrowding? Some of them are, some of them are in biological scenarios, and so I highlighted that. I mean, if you look at 80, that one's over objective in all of them. And supposed that it was claims of overcrowding. And so they had 3,000 hunters, of which 2,000 were non residents. They limited everybody. I don't know if you go from 3,000 to 2,000 hunters, do you still feel crowded? I think it depends on your own personal preference. 2,000 hunters is still a lot of hunters. We're not creating more unit 201. <coughs> um, is hunter density improving? Maybe for some. Does that answer your question? Go ahead. A few years back, if I remember right, uh, CPW did a thing where your preference points, you didn't have to burn all your preference points to get a, a one point. Oh, all point, 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 point. Yeah, I think it cost you additional points or something like that. It it was, did that work out for them? Because that would be the answer to what you're talking about. It was recently reviewed again at the commission level, and there was no action taken that I'm aware of today. I thought it was coming back on last month's uh, agenda, but they, it hasn't come back. You know, to talk yeah, about it was, this, it, was discussed, it was discussed by Council Voice in, in, in this room yeah. about three months ago when we had ours. And, and actually, staff and, and, and really, while they staff. The pushback on the point banking. I kind of like it, but they said it would, it would reduce the ability for people to play it because somebody, you know, with 15 points put in for a five unit, a five point area, right? And then and then somebody who thinks they're going to get it won't get it. Personally, well, I, you know, I, I, you gotta, you're going to have to get rid of those points that you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Well, several I, hundred thousand points are out there for residents. I think the system's working. On average, residents have three points or less. There's 80,000 applicants with zero points. There's very few people with a ton of points. Why should I, with zero points, let you draw in front of me for five or 10 years based on the number of points that you have? Because I did what I wanted to do. I mean, I'm drawing licenses every, every year. Why should I wait longer in line? Because we adopt my bank. That's just personal opinion. Let, let's leave it there. I'm sorry. Let's go to that because we've got maybe 10 minutes of reports and five minutes. All right. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I'll be around if anybody wants to arm myself. So, Paul's going to give a quick report on turkeys in Colorado and comparing that with other states.
companies also that are seeing a decline. How many here are turkey hunts? How many turkey hunts the boat? Um, and then the shotguns, of course. How many fall turkey hunts with a rifle, for example? Okay, all right. So, how many hunt other states like Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, out of state? So the estimated turkey populations in the surrounding states, and this is prior to the big decrease in turkey populations in surrounding states. Colorado, we have around 30,000 turkeys. Uh, Nebraska, 145,000. Kansas, 300,000. Wyoming, 15,000. Oklahoma, 94,000. And Texas claims they have 500,000 turkeys. Very hard to estimate the number of turkeys. So these are strictly estimates. And then again, this is prior to the decline in some of these states. Nationwide, five to six million turkeys. What is interesting about the wild turkey and hunting it is that it's one of the only birds that we kill when it, during the mating season and during the brood season in the spring. But we love to hear those gobbles, and as long as there's good turkey population, it's a great way to hunt them. Recently, since uh, the mid 90s or mid 2000s, hunters across the nation have seen less and less turkeys, less and less gobbles, less and less hens. What are the reasons for all that? Here in Colorado, turkey hunting, hunters have increased 250% since 1999 to almost 20,000 plus or minus hunters. Hunter success was 25% in those later years. Most eastern Colorado has limited draw tags, except on some private lands where you can put a counter tag. And of course, a lot of country west of the continental divide allows for the counter tags in many of those areas. How many of you that turkey hunt seem to have seen a decline in turkey for years? There's one, two, three, four, five, six people. How many have seen an increase in turkeys? All right. And stable turkey population? All right. How many of you hunt mainly in the mountains? And then how about eastern prairie? Okay. So factors in some of the that turkeys have to face to create holts in the spring. Here in Colorado, we have weird weather. Sometimes it's too hot, too cold, too dry, too wet. Mountain Americans have to put up with snows and cold. The number one factor is drought. Extreme, co extreme snow cover is also serious. Flooding on the South Platte River. Remember about five or six years ago, we had almost two years of flooding over the banks, and then this year, we probably will have the same thing. And so those nests and those bolts that are being born are gonna get wiped out this year. <coughs> Turkey season structure. If the seasons in some states start too early, that's kind of disrupts the hens and the toms for doing what they wanna do. Habitat degradation and poor bolt production are top limiting factors for a healthy turkey population to be consistent. Of course, you have predators, raccoons, skunks, are fried and desecrated. Then we have foxes, coyotes, bobcat, raptors, and others. Changing agricultural practices, fall plowing, and chemical additives in the soil contribute to low pulse and turkey population. Diseases, avian flu, avian fox, and others are a possibility. They did have some of the avian flu fishing up in Wyoming and turkeys but I haven't seen or heard about too much or any here in Colorado, except lots of snow geese died of it, especially the juveniles, and some raccoons <coughs> died of that. I'm gonna skip some of this because we're running out of time. But, uh, oh, so we know folks, 10 or 12 eggs, maybe two or three chicks will end up alive when that's all over here. Okay, predation of broken eggs from da da da. Some states, one state has had less than one fault for hatching. And that doesn't even replace the hens for the following year. You gotta have these two, have a male and female fault. So leading biologists, not only in Colorado, but elsewhere, do we really understand what constitutes sustainable turkey numbers? It may be unrealistic, unrealistic to expect the abundance as seen during the boom phrase of the late 90s to the mid 2000s will the numbers will the number at which population stabilize long time so do we expect 
all those turkeys that we saw in the mid 2000s be the same in the future? Or is it coming down and that's what we have to plan on the level today? So drastic measures are being handled by Nebraska. They're spending $1.8 million on a five year study of what's going on with their turkey population. A uh, researcher from Georgia, Dr. Uh, Chambers, is a lead turkey biologist, and a lot of the states are adapting his uh, methodology to determine turkeys and the decline in a lot of those south and eastern states. So what's happening here in Colorado, uh, and especially in the southeast or northeast area, but I'm sure this can also be in all of the eastern, because we have the Arkansas and we have the South Black River, which is a major habitat for our turkeys in Colorado. Um, according to Ed Dorman, who I wasn't able to be here, but I did uh, talk to him, uh, he said Colorado is experiencing sort of a natural fluctuation in turkey populations. So given the environment we have and the weather we have here, you can see why we have these natural fluctuations from flooding the river to droughts, for pulp survival to changing chemicals. So Colorado even though we have 30,000 turkeys, only 24% of them live east of the continental divide. That's less than 8,000 birds. Now compare that to 145,000 birds in Nebraska. So we have a small population, limited habitat, and so our, our populations can fluctuate a lot. Some days we have boom years, and other days we, and other years we don't. Uh, I talked to uh, uh, Levi Cooks. He's a, he's a technician out at Tamarack State Wildlife. Now, I'll quote him, as far as hunters seeing turkeys, the past three years have been extreme. We have gone from COVID straight into a drought, and now a record-setting wet spring. The guys that I have checked to see turkeys, uh, see turkeys, but they're all looking for toms. I see turkeys almost every day driving around, but the numbers are down. Our winter was hard coming out of the drought, and now the flood, we probably lost a lot of nests and our young ones again. So how are the turkeys doing in eastern Colorado? Well, with the hand that is being dealt with them, they're doing okay, but you've got to say, yeah, there are going to be highs and lows in our turkey population in the east. Some will say, yeah, I've seen equal amount of turkeys, less, some, some more in some areas. Uh, we all know what the seasons are and, and the take is, but uh, if Colorado does happen to experience a decrease in turkey population, and we could lose hunting opportunities. Uh, we could use, uh, lose um, uh, licenses in some areas. And so that could happen in the future. Uh, based on our turkey numbers, uh, will Colorado spend the money to do any turkey research if we see a, a, a big a downfall in the turkey population? Uh, that could happen, or it could not, based on the priorities of, of, of bird and wildlife management. So uh, any quick questions at all about what I just reported? Just kind of gives you an overview of we seem to be sort of ups and downs, peaks and valleys in turkey population. We have a low population of turkeys uh, compared to other states, but other states are seeing a drastic decline uh, up to 40, 50% in some areas. And I'm sure that research that's being done in those states will help our biologists figure out that that's also happening in our region. So thank you.
state of Colorado. We have to have, you know, a general area where probably you put wolves on state properties. That's kind of where, uh, where we're looking at it. And so that's kind of where we're at with it right now. Uh, if you have any questions that I can answer, I'll be happy to, but we're working through that process. Uh, our, our folks get very involved with uh, landowners in Western Colorado, Central Colorado. So that's where we're at with it. Any questions? <coughs> It's me like they're coming on their own. We don't need to go in anymore. A lot of people thought that. Yeah, yeah. We still got we still have wolves out of the landscape right now. Uh, but you know that doesn't preclude us from following the same strategy. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Well, that's a conversation. So we're right there. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean to. I do want to thank everybody for coming out. And also. I want to especially introduce Todd Kozak. He, he, he just hired him as Erie Wildlife Manager out in Russia, Fort Morgan area. I kind of passed over when I was, was introduced to everybody. But we're, yeah. we're real happy to have Todd in the, in the ranks of the AWM group. I think he's going to do a great job out there on the Eastern Plains managing our wildlife. <coughs> Congrats. Yeah, CPW have a presentation on the big game season structure. I know we kind of we're getting pressed for brevity here, but it does seem like so many. Kind of jump right over there. Yeah. Yeah. There on that QR code that's on the agenda that I told you people right. there. There's an entire presentation about all of the talking points and the consideration. Right. I mean, it's kind of some of the stuff that we saw in the surveys for the past two years, and and that was kind of my the, the purpose of coming tonight was to ask why after after 18 to 24 months of surveys and roundtables and uh, Zoom calls through COVID and. These, these 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 discussions that we all keep sitting in all residents in the room that at the end of the day CPW went to the commission and recommended no changes um, would have been what late last year if I'm not mistaken Steve um, and now that we're rolling into this new big game season structure it's kind of like we dumped a lot of those ideas that came out of those work groups and it's like we had already thrown up so many softballs for CPW to kind of take and run and then whenever, I mean, I almost got out of my chair when I saw the uh, no changes recommended at the commission meeting. Um, so are, well, are we going back to the drawing board with nothing? And why are we not seeing those ideas kind of presented as, as alternatives at this point um, compared to like, oh, well, it's coming up. We're going to have to sort, sort something out. I know one change that actually came out of the meeting we had here was the change to the uh, high demand draws. Added a fair number because I, I had a, a sports person provide me with a bunch of information, and we added, I think, over a thousand licenses to residents. Right, was that was the update? Yeah, that, that was dates. right, and that, but that yeah. was based on the right input from these meetings, right? And that right. was just done 60 days ago in one of the uh, one of the what was, it was approved of just before the draw. Right, I, I guess, I guess, really, my frustration is. That was the only thing that felt like it came out of you know that entire process um, to include like the surveys that are being done and it, there was an overwhelming response from resident sportsmen that say hey we want to see we want to see something that looks like a uh, residents have an over the counter opportunity we need to go with like a non resident over the counter cap or That's limited. What that process is right now. That's what yeah. So you're, the no change thing might be that there might have been. 50 different ideas that were presented in big game season structure and through the process of the big game attitude survey we had to narrow down the issues that were presented to be the hottest topics so to speak while still considering other options when you say no change we haven't made any decisions on big game season structure related to season length and timing and whether we're going to need more archery or rifling that's exactly what we're doing right now is collecting that data the decisions will be made in the future. So we're summarizing all of that data. It'll be presented to the Wildlife Commission at the August 23rd commission meeting. And then it will move to the process of decisions being made. So say right. no change is, is not we, represented. We presented three alternatives last fall. And there were three alternatives presented to the commission. And then the, then the CPW recommendation with three alternatives on the table was no action at this time Let's address it in the 2025 big game structure changes. And it was like, that, that was 18 to 20 something months of work that got us to that three alternative proposition, right? 
last fall. And then we said no changes. So I, I guess really the reason that there's only two younger guys sitting here, I have five, six buddies who didn't come tonight because they said, man, we did this last time. We did this last year. You know, kind of getting fed up with CPW, not listening to the recommended changes of resident sportsmen because it kind of feels like we're beholden to the Outfitter Association and uh, some of our, our, our bigger landowners that are out there. I, I mean, it, it's what, when you come to this and you see a big game structure on the, uh, the agenda, you know, you kind of hope to see CPW throw some ideas out and then the room back those ideas around and then CPW be able to take something from that as opposed to, I'm going to scan it on my phone, I'm going to go back home, I'm going to do it in my dark little dungeon, and then it's going to go to the abyss of the internet. And I don't know if anything ever gets done with those ideas because, quite frankly, it didn't. It didn't change anything last time, with the exception of the three-year rolling season. Which, were, you, were you able to go to the big game season structure that was in the Northeast area? I'm, what, like, in 2020? Like, no, we had a meeting here June 15th. <coughs> no, I'm, I'm no. rotating work schedule, so no. I'm here every time I go. Yeah, yeah. Four, four months ago, we had a meeting in this room. Yeah, yeah. yeah June 15th. And unfortunately, yeah. as Steve said, 133 people attended. 300 states. Just about half of the staff. Yeah. 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 Now, it's moving forward, and it was kind of segmented. Instead of everything in the big game season structure, they took some out of that and did it handled it like the license allocations, resident, mm -hmm. non-resident, and that. But what you're talking about, and what Shannon was talking about, is what we're talking about in the surveys now is going to be handled by the commission and staff in the next couple of months. Okay. All right. I mean, still, yeah. still on the line. So, so what, what Paul was talking about is the allocation did change. So the commission decided they didn't want to look at allocation and the resident, non-resident, Process. So we, we dealt with that. We, 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 get, we took that back to right. the commission. They changed it from 65 to 75, 25. Right. Resident, non-resident. So I would say that is not a no action uh, action that, that came out of right. the discussion. Yeah, and what did happen during that period is staff actually re recommend across the board 75, 25, not only for the normal draw, but for the hybrid draw. There was enough input from sports people that said, wait a minute, commission already said we would go with the 75-25, and now you want to, I'm sorry, 80-20. And you're eliminating that, so they, we convinced, we... The one commissioner said today that meeting. Yeah. You know, 75 and maintain the 80-20, so, so, so. Let me, just on that same thing, yeah. is, is there a way to if you have a to if you see a topic on the agenda and you would like more time dedicated to it, please reach out to Paul and Saul. I mean, the intention behind a meeting like this is to cover, at times, multiple topics and move through them and not necessarily focus on one topic. But you, if you have interest in hearing about a particular topic, then please reach out to us. And I, I realize our, our responsibility as agency people and sportsmen and women is to take it back to the commission and look the commission what's going on, leadership team of which I'm a member, and we, we let people know what's going on, but it's, it's for general. So when the commission is voting on this and you don't show up, and I know everybody works, yeah. but if you don't show up and you don't have that same conversation that you, you're just having right with us, right. you don't get the benefit of your particular opinion, um, which they may be swayed by if you went and talked to them. Oh, yeah. so, and I, right. so we can, you know, we had a commission meeting in, in Aurora in March, uh, we didn't have any people show up at the commission meeting. And those, that's the, that is the body that is making the rules that you're also concerned about. And I realize that it's frustrating and it's them against us kind of a thing. But really, if you show up and you voice your opinion, Hildy's done it, you know, for decades. So, you know, and, and, I, and I'm not throwing him under the bus in any way at all because he shows up and he presents his opinion and they either listen to me or they don't, you know. But I'm, I'm saying, please do that because we don't get enough people. We, we're frustrated as agency folks too. We go to the commission meeting, where are all the sportsmen? When they, and it's like, we feel like, you know, we're checked out from you or, and, and maybe you feel the same way. And so one, and one, we, final, we and one final thought, uh, Sol and I represent sports people in this area. Bring us with your ideas. Two, we have two meetings a year. One next one's next March. 
And three is Saul and I will be going down to Breckenridge at the end of this month to attend an all the round table and, and caucus people get together along with the director and many uh, staff will be there. We'll be talking about what came out of the region. Next Saturday. Next Saturday, there you go. So, well, yes. Okay, so I was in the caucus meeting last night virtually, um, the Western Slope caucus meeting. I keep hearing CPW people say we need to show up and voice our opinions. I was hoping for a chance to go out there and talk and ask some questions. Where do I need to show up to talk about this? I mean, I'm concerned with over-the-counter archery. So I showed up tonight, but it seems like, you know, Steve had some good information, but the meeting's ending so and I never got a chance to ask any questions. Up, you can sign up for three minutes virtually if you want to. Commission meeting, and the commission meeting is going to be um, in Gunnison next week. So you can sign up to speak, but in, um, we have an open open forum where you can show up virtually from the comfort of your own home and, and give the commission the, the benefit of your input that way. Or you can show up in person at a meeting and sign up and talk for three minutes and do the same thing. Okay, so I showed up today, but if I, if I wanted to speak for a few minutes, I would add to, uh, you know, uh, talk with you guys ahead of time and would be best I mean that's what Steve did. Here. Okay. That's how we got it. Unfortunately we only have an hour and a half. Okay. We have topics that we brought forward plus what the commission has I mean what the staff has so we, we don't have a lot of time. I, I get it now I know because I yeah I wanted to speak but the okay. meeting's the ending so we the next one I'll the reason we didn't get into detail here yeah. about the BGTS was that because of all the all the activity and meetings etc up to this point so Last time we had this meeting, and then we have the, the in-person meeting here. We have to really address that now. So the meeting in Gunnison next week, I can register to get a, a three-minute yeah. yeah. section yeah. And, and speak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. a Zoom call. Yeah. And how do I do that? Who do I contact to get my three minutes? Information. We will get you in the lower corner, and she can let you in on the Zoom. Okay. So let us take the last five minutes and do this uh, door prizes. Okay. Good. Great. So what I've got is a uh, hardbound copy of the Colorado Bowman record books. It's a little outdated, but there's a lot of great information in here. I'm at I'm a Western Reader, so here's a six-pack of Louis Lamore books. All right. Here's a Elk Cunning the Flat Tops. I met this gentleman in, uh, in the Flat Tops years ago, and he wrote this book, so that's a door prize. Uh, here's a Here's, here's a little short bugle, and then we've got three hats. Oh, there we go. Colorado bow hunting. So last three numbers, numbers. four, three, nine. What are you doing? Four, three, nine, last numbers. Four, three, nine. Four, three, nine. Four, three, nine. There we go. Bingo. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, hat. So this was donated to us. How many people here use Onyx? So if you're in, I, uh, on the side, I run a, a foundation called the Rocky Mountain Heroes Foundation. We take combat wounded vets and their kids out on the street Colorado. But through our foundation, you can get a 50% off of uh, Onyx. So your membership in our foundation takes you off. Okay, six flags of Larry Lamar. Oh, first hat. Okay, let's throw them in here. This and that. First hat. Four, five, one. Four, five, one. Okay.
Four four zero. Next. Four five zero. Four five zero. A good read. First half four five five. I think they must be keeping fish right around 13. There they go, run that way. There we go. I know. Uh, 443. There we go. Awesome. Again, thanks everybody for coming. There you go, sir. The next, the next meeting is going to be in March. We'll have some different topics. I'm sure. Good to see you all there. Bring your friends.